This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Anyway. Well, Luke Carrier fell. I was I had office there with the Shasta Trinity National Forest. The and I was in the research end of the Forest Service. But we had us the Shasta Trinity gave us a few rooms there in, in downtown Reading in that time. And uh, their wildlife biologist, Lou Carrierfell, uh, came down and sat down next to my desk. He said, Bill, he knew I was birding, I guess, because this is, but I'm thinking of starting a full fledged charter member of the National Audubon Society chapter. What do you think of it? Well, I said, I'm skeptical because we had a Lassen Bird Club that's been gone now for six or seven years. And um, I don't know if there's enough interest around Reading to, to, to get the club because the National was now um, requiring a, some set amount of money and a, a large number of in, new memberships and a couple other things which seemed to be make it almost impossible. But, uh, but Lou was determined he had a small cadre of of canvassers, and by a large, by a guy they found uh, a lot of latent interest in bird in the bird club, in in Reading and environs, and they were able to scrape up the money and uh, new members, and and they made a uh, and and so they uh, they were successful, which was really great, and. Um, so the first court order of business was to name the organization after the charter. Well, the charter hadn't arrived yet, but we knew that we had made the group. So um, we had uh, the fir a first. Now I'm a little bit skeptical where the when the board was and who was on the board. I don't have that information. But anyway, oh, I do. Yes, I do. The initial officers were Lou Carrierfell, the wildlife biologist, Vice President Judy Harper. Okay. No, no Judy Harper. Uh, Marguerite Lennon was treasurer, and her son Bruce was uh, treasurer. Oh yeah, remember those folks? Yeah. Oh, now we're getting into George's territories. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, I have a little incident. A little. Uh, Marguerite Lennon was a, a character. She's an older woman. That that's, doesn't uh, mean any, uh, there's no association with those two terms. Uh, and she uh, came from um, Sausalito and she was a victim of too much taxing in Sausalito. This is before Proposition 13. And she couldn't afford to live there. So she moved to Shasta Lake City with her son, Bruce. And just as she was moving, they passed Proposition 13. And so she felt that she could uh, probably have uh, stayed on in Sausalito, but the, the timing was not great. But she was a member of uh, the, the Golden Gate Audubon Society. And so she was, she'd come and um, say, well, the Golden Gate Audubon Society did such and such. Why aren't you doing such and such? Well, because they had a, a membership and a tri and a uh, bank account. I don't know how many times greater than ours, but maybe ten or twenty. And so we couldn't afford to do that. But she never could quite. Uh, it never quite ran with her. Anyway, um, <clears throat> she was uh, she was a memorable character back in the early days. The first order of business was to pick a chapter name and the name of the newsletter. So we got together and uh, and uh, came up with a tentative list of uh, chapter names. All of them are rather um, expected and dull. One was Lassen Area Audubon, uh, Wintu Audubon, well, North Sacramento River Audubon, and Reading Area Audubon. Well, when I went up for membership the next month, you know, next week. And they choose Wintu Audubon, which was probably a good choice. 
But then there, your board took a more lighthearted approach from the newsletter. And my contribution was uh, not accepted, but uh, it was based on my uh, pleasure with a name for a Southern California Audubon Society called Sea and Sage. And uh, so I uh, thought, well, what's the equivalent to Sea and Sage here in Reading? Dust and brush didn't go over. So that was one of them. Then the other one was Crow's Nest, and Brown Toey was a third. Well, they chose, uh, they, none of them uh, fell on um, fertile ground, and so they, they came up with Chirp and Chatter. I guess with the hope that the chatter would be worthwhile, at least sometimes. And um, so that's what we, that's what came of it. Now, when we chose the uh, chapter name, uh, Win to Audubon, a person, um, somebody, I don't remember who, I don't know if there's anybody here that was remembers who it was, suggested that we write a letter to the Win to tribe and request the use of their name, which came, which everybody agreed, oh yes, it's a good idea. So we did. I wrote a letter, and they were, and went to tribe was. Well, I would say probably shocked and pleased that somebody had actually re requested their the use of their name because it, it seemed like it, the way they said it, it was probably the first time. And uh, Dan Greeny here was uh, president at the time, and he said, "Oh, we got to get that letter." And um, where's that letter? both the letter that we sent and the, the response and we couldn't i couldn't find it it was 40 years 50 years ago i don't know and so um my ali said just wing it then and uh, so that's what we did and but i i knew that it was correct in in their response and uh, it was uh, so anyway that's that's what happened our first meeting in 1976, was, and for some years thereafter, was at the uh, Sequoia School Library. George, you remember that? Any? Oh yeah. Thirty years. Guess that's it. On the, uh, the library, I remember we had quite a few. At the, the attendance was quite large at first, but then uh, it started to dwindle down a bit, and. Uh, but we uh, uh, we we were very active in the first uh, year, and um, we had some couple of good actually crackerjack world world scale uh, scale birders. Uh, Steve Lehman and Phil Dietrich were uh, members, and uh, they got and they were under the. Um, the first order of business was to change. Oh, the first order of business, even for the Lassen Bird Club, was to have a Christmas bird count. And the Lassen Bird Club was had it centered right downtown, ready. But that uh, was Lehman and, and Dietrich wanted to move it somewhere west so that they could get different habitats. So it's now just north of of, of Keswick Dam and Keswick Lake. But uh, there's a little bit about uh, uh, Steve Lehman and uh, and Phil Dietrich, and maybe uh, George can remember this. Oh, oh! Since I talked to you, George, I did some did some things came up. Hmm. Uh, Steve Lehman was uh, from Red Bluff, and he was his girlfriend was a um, a birder and and so was his mother now was his mother myrtle baker george oh um Mer mercedes bailey it's his mother-in-law oh mercedes bailey was yeah. oh yeah. okay well mercedes as far as i know is still alive yes she has a uh, in an apartment there on hilltop she came i used to bring her to the meetings quite often and uh Oh, it was Mercedes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, her daughter was, uh, uh, well, I eventually got married, I think. 
I got Steve Raymond in the birding, and he really jumped on a full bore. Because by a few years, he was an expert. I remember going down on a Balls Ferry Road on a regular field trip, and on a turn there, and I don't know, you're quite a ways down, there was a farm pond, and it was well diked, and there was a fence there. You couldn't see over into the water, but you could see birds flying over the water. And Steve, he could identify swallows by their size and shape of their wings and all that sort of stuff. How did he do that? Well, of course, it took a lot of time and so forth, but everybody was aghast that he could do that. There was another, uh, okay, but then Phil Dietrich, oh, well, I should say that, uh, that uh, Steve Lehman went on to UC Berkeley and got an ornithological degree. And he got a PhD there, and he joined up with uh, the BLM in Bakersfield. And as far as I know, he was, his full career was in Bakersfield or in southern uh, San Joaquin Valley. I don't know if he's still living or not. I, I lost that. Bill, uh, yeah. Bill, I'll just I'll just chime in here. I actually met him before I ever knew of Redding, before I ever yeah. came. And uh, I met him. He was living at and studying at Lake Isabella up there above Bakersfield in the in the okay. southern Sierras. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. All right, and then the next one, and Phil Dietrich was more homegrown. He had a degree in conservation from Sonoma State. I don't know, nah, but then he worked in the summers for the Shasta Trinity National Forest studying bald eagles on Shasta Lake. But he couldn't get a permanent job because what's conservation? I mean, there's they were hard to, it was hard to get that into a, something that, uh, a piece of paper that the government would accept as a, an official. So uh, he did that for several years. And then he finally went to Chico and got a degree, which uh, allowed him to uh, enter the, uh, the bureaucracy. And he ended up in uh, Wairuica and he was head of the local of, the, of that, section for the um, Fish and Wildlife Service. And uh, as far as I know, he still lives in Mount Shasta. Now, there was another person that you may remember, at least George might, and I remembered it after we talked. There was a lovely lady called by the name of Myrtle Baker. George, ring a mm -hmm. bell? I don't recall her. No. Well, Myrtle was um, a birder, and she loved the, um, well, I don't know why this stuck in my mind. You see, you're getting a lot of things that are unrelated that are in my mind, but I'm going to give them to you anyway. Uh, she loved that Mexican restaurant, which is now where Carlene's is. It was Ramona's. See, yes. I, knew it would come. I knew it would come in contact. Ramona's was a famous or an infamous Mexican restaurant there where Carlin's was. And uh, purists would just scoff at it, you know, because it was really looking back on it was not that good, but Myrtle Baker loved it. And she always brought her grandson, Grant. And uh, well, Myrtle was the mother of Bobby Baker, who was district attorney for Shasta County at the time. Anyway, the Grant was the was the kid, and Grant would always cause consternation at field trips because he he wanted to participate, and so he'd see a bird, and that's such and such. He'd seen it in the bird book, you know, and uh, but he didn't know, have, have any idea what it was. But so uh, what, on the offhand chance that maybe he did see what he said. We had to drop everything and hunt it up. And oh, Grant, that's Grant again. But anyway, I remember that part. <laughs> the uh, first Christmas bird count, uh, Steve Lehman brought a whole crew from Arcata. And they uh, did a and they sent us off 
pretty, set us up pretty well because they got a lot of different birds. One of them was a female blue grosbeak. Now, these guys were semi-professional. And here we were just starting up. Blue grosbeak, a female in, in December. Well, we had to put it down because you know, they came all the way from Arcata. Uh, and it's still on their on our uh, main record. They also also another crew uh, got a long eared owl, which is was a, new for us. They were over on uh, in Old Shasta on um, Middle Creek Road, I guess it is, and it's a steep side hill. So they were getting down on the side hill, and they looked horizontally at a tree down below. And then there was this great. It was a long-eared owl. Probably was, you know, because uh, they, those owls are much more common than we think they are. Anyway, that was another high point. Well, um, the next year, Luke Carrierfell um, uh, was transferred. Well, he got a job with the Bureau of Land Management. I think he was from Alaska originally, and he got a job in Alaska, so he he left. But we sure did. Uh, miss him in the first year and uh, all his enthusiasm and getting us getting us going the uh, first things that besides the christmas bird count was that we did was a second saturday bird walk i was surprised that that was started right there in 76 or 77. Uh, was so uh, really our first local activity and then uh, the field trips were of a little different nature than they are today. We we went further, and uh, and uh, we did uh, places like Lower Klamath and the National or Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge. And then we uh, we went to a visit to uh, the Four Ranch. Ruby, I think the first name was Ruby Four H O R R, and they gave. Uh, all the land of the state, and it became the Osmoe uh, of a Spring State Park. State Park. A land, a, um, I was going to say landlocked, but I mean it, it was only visible, only uh, approachable by the water and Big Lake in um, in, in uh, Fall River. But uh, we did. Uh, we immediately we went to Honey Lake Basin too. To see the the sage grouse, the lek, and that's what we're planning on doing, I guess, uh, next month or maybe this month. Now, and we went with uh, Win Two and Alcal, Sacramento, and Rogue River chapters. That must have been 70, 77, maybe. And we did see uh, quite a few uh, male. Sage grouse and on, on their lek, and that was that was a thrill. And we went back uh, several times to in 1981 with the Santa Clara Audubon Society and the Aldecal in the um, in 2008, if I, if my memory serves. George, you might say uh, you might talk a little bit about the winter camping at uh, oh. <laughs> at the Honey Lake, and I yeah, can't we were, remember the name of the campground. We, it was at the uh, the refuge, the Honey Lake Refuge, but no, I didn't look up the name of the campground. But but it was uh, we weren't really seasoned campers, I don't think. With that cold of weather, it got down to fourteen or sixteen something, like that. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> one of the members. Rich Redmond had a really rugged tent. It was sort of roundish and it had to climb in through a tube and, and uh, not, not real roomy, but so by the time we got all in there, we were pretty much like sardines and it felt claustrophobic. It started getting cold and the ice was freezing on the inside of the tent. It was very icy in there. Had to be pretty brave if you're going to go to the bathroom or something to jump up and run out. But uh, I remember that. And then one of our members, Bill Bottermaiden, was a very tall guy. And he brought the wrong sleeping bag. 
<laughs> he brought a short sleeping bag for one of his kids by mistake. So we heard him stomping around outside. He was sleeping in his car, which is the coldest place you could possibly sleep. And we heard him stomping around trying to stay warm. And finally, we didn't hear him. He ended up sleeping in the, uh, the bathroom. They had a heated bathroom to keep the pipes from freezing <laughs> at the refuge campground. So he slept on the floor in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> Was was beginning to sound not that bad. <laughs> yeah, I remember that about it. And also, we yeah. went out to the lake the next. We got up very early and went to the lake. And that was fun. Yeah, it was very active at that time. Yeah, Bill Vandermeer. Yeah, and he was field trip. He read a lot of field trips subsequently. But there was a rugged camping that we wouldn't have much. Well, the people who did it around not like george and myself went probably go, wouldn't go on anymore like that and we don't have enough younger people so we did a, our field trips were a little bit more adventuresome than they are today but um oh uh, john coon you remember john coon oh yeah he uh he, he loved a good joke he was always uh, laughing and telling stories. Maybe George, you could you could tell that one. Oh yeah, I don't, I don't know how many names I want to name. We, but it could happen to any of us. All of us get a little arrogant sometimes if we're uh, out birding and leading a trip and we want to keep it moving. We, we might want to rush along. So John tells this, and I wasn't on this trip. Um, the bird, the trip leader was trying to get was trying to end the trip fairly early and was moving along pretty fast. And he saw this bald eagle in a tree quite a ways away. And uh, he called it a bald eagle. And there was a couple of younger people there, you know, older teenagers, something like that. And they said, I don't know. It doesn't look like a bald eagle. He said, it's a bald eagle. Kept walking. <laughs> he wouldn't accept anything else. And uh, they got a little farther and there was two red-tailed hawks together, very close together. But you can see the head and the beak and they look large. It looked like one bird. And one of them flew away. <laughs> and the youngest kid came up to the leader and said, Mister, Mister, <laughs> half your bald eagle flew away. <laughs> so yeah, sort of brought him down to earth. Yeah, I must have built the Bonder Maiden's uh, chagrin, you know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, we were, uh, the, the chapter is under the same um, restrictions as it was when it started, as far as the, the um, Constitution and bylaws. And we had to vote for new slave officers every year, and it's become quite a, it really is sort of a burden. Um, but of course, we could always reelect the existing members, which we do a lot of times. Anyway, the second group of uh, was myself as president, and um, Chirp and Chatter editor was Phil Dietrich. And recording secretary was Gene Belmonte. Any remembrance of Gene Belmonte? Oh, yeah. New Gene. George does, but yeah. Any any stories about Gene Belmonte? No, it, it, she's the one that organized the trip to the horror ranch. She knew Ivy Horror yeah, yeah. pretty well. So I I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we and she she put people up there too. Or they yeah. camped in her backyard, I guess it was. Yeah. We went over there. And okay, and then that's uh, one of the first things that we did besides uh, Tech and Saturday Bird Walk and these other things was we hosted the first meeting of the Northern California Audubon Council, which is still going on, of course. But this was the first year of our existence. And I thought that was pretty brave of us to even accept that. 
And it was held, do you remember, George, when we held it the first year in 1977? I'm not so sure I was involved in that one. We had one a few years later that, that we were. But that one, though, I don't recall that one. Anyway, it was a success. We had 10 different um, chapters, no, 10 Audubon members from the chapter. And then we had, uh, I don't know how many, uh, let's see. 30 attendees from nine chapters. So that was pretty good. And I don't know where we held it. But anyway, subsequently, we held uh, the meetings uh, in 19, in two, uh, let's see. Well, we held it uh, at least in 2010 and 15. And that was under the, uh, and, and uh, we had it at the McConnell Foundation headquarters a very luxurious place to have a council meeting. And uh, they were very kind. Of course, we had to do it quite a ways in advance because we had it right there in the headquarters and there. So that uh, put us on the map for Northern California pretty much. <clears throat> then, we had one uh, earlier, yeah, go ahead. We had one earlier in the, uh in the 80s or so at the temporary building of the Reading Arts Center in Caldwell Park. Oh, that's where we held the meeting. Yes, that's yeah. this is what I'm talking about, the council meetings, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, after after we uh, gave up the um, general meetings at the Sequoia School Library, uh, there's a gap in my memory there. But uh, George, do you remember? Um, by this time, George is in the picture. Yeah, I hope I'm not forgetting that. We went from the Sequoia Library to the uh, Department of Education on Magnolia Street, the building there. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 And we were there for a while. And then we, from there, we went to, the, I think that's when we went to the temporary building at the Reading Art Museum. Behind the yeah. Reading Art Museum there. It was a bigger building than it looked like. I didn't think it would work. But then Chrysalis Charter School we ended up at. Yes, the Chrysalis School at uh, Turtle Bay. Yeah. But, um, yes, it was a charter school in a um, prefab or a temporary structure there. But the, yeah. the main thing I remember is they had the little kiddie chairs. Oh, and, yeah, I forgot about that. Some of us uh, had wider hips than the, uh, would, yeah. allow, would be allowed in those little kiddie chairs. <laughs> and by this time, we had another uh, famous burger, um, Stuart Keith came. He was a world famous uh, ornithologist, worked for the uh, New York uh, Academy of Science or something, and had, and he was a co author of a multi volume issue of Birds of Africa. Anyway, he was married to uh, a local, and he retired here. And um, so we, uh, we were there for quite a while. And then, um, I got the, uh, a, a notion that we could do better than that with Turtle Bay. And so I talked to them about it and it didn't, uh, they tried to tell them that they, well, when they started out the Turtle Bay uh, Science Park, there was a lot of local friction because they took over the local um, uh, organization that we had, it was run by, um, well, it, it was it was established there at, at in um, in Lake Reading Park at the Carter House Science Museum, and they took that over as a part of a a, mu a natural science umbrella, and uh, we didn't uh, well stepped on some toes, you know. Anyway, so I was telling uh, the people at Turtle Bay that, hey, you could improve your public relations if you allow some of the local conservation organizations to use the auditorium there. Well, I, maybe it, it fermented in their minds if it took them a year. And then finally, I got, we got permission to use their auditorium, which was really nice. I mean, we had the a big screen and uh, I mean, it was, it was really uptown. 
And uh, we had that for quite a few years. Now, there was uh, one thing I was going to remember, but maybe it's just a de detail that really wasn't necessary, was we had an annual meeting at the end of the year. Our year was the same as it is now. It was September through May. And then we had the summer hiatus. So we had a, um, the first time we had a, a luncheon at Sam's, a local restaurant in downtown Reading, I think, George, was it? Yeah, it was uh, just in downtown Reading. It was, it was, just, yeah. Nothing special, I suppose. No. And then we had potluck dinners for a couple of years. And I'm not sure where they were. And then finally, we ended up at the tower house as a picnic, like we do today. But the first few years, it was more of an occasion than it is now. Now we have just half a dozen people to show up at the, at the start of the, line of the year. One of the uh, interesting things that we did right about was in 1978, I think, was put out a checklist of birds of Turtle Bay and vicinity. I don't have a copy of that. Does anybody have it? And I'm not sure that that was even the first one. But anyway, that's what I, that's, that's the memory remembrance I have. If anybody can. Thing is, I'm the only charter member, so I can say anything, and there's no. We write it. But anyway, that was subsequently revised in, um, was in 78, was the first one. And it was revised and enlarged and became the um, Birds of Shasta County that we have today. And then, and that was in 81. And then in 2005 and 2016 and 2021, it's been revised. And it's already obsolete because we found the great gray owl, which uh, I had mixed feelings about. At least I'd like to come out with the, uh, the revision that was up to date, everything. But no, we darn old owl showed up. So anyway, um, I have them here, and uh, if, I, and I'm, if I didn't have to have a flat tire on a uh, all-wheel drive vehicle, I would have distributed them to uh, some of the places that we were recommended, like the uh, welcome, the, the welcome um, uh, place there at Anderson. That seemed to be the place that uh, would take most of them, and because they would stock the uh, all the uh, rack cars where they where they were we get a lot of uh, uh, publicity but i haven't gotten down there yet because i didn't want to drive on that uh, donut wheel any longer than i had to we had an annual camp out early on and i have it as 81 does that make sense to you the first uh -huh. one that was yeah. at Lawson Volcanic National Park, and we invited all the local chapters. Um, Alta Cal, Redwood Region, and Redbud were uh, the ones that participated the first year. That was in 1981, and we've had it every year since then, in July, usually, or June. So, um, that's takes care of uh, the, the first year or two. And we've been a regular participant in uh, quite a few local science fairs and natural resource fairs. One of the first ones was in 78. And we had a display in the downtown Reading Mall when it was really a going concern. Anybody remember that? Yeah, it was pretty well done. Yeah. Anyway, uh, that was the that was in '78, I think, is the date I had from the uh, chirp and shatters that I looked at. And then the next one was um, the annual return of the salmon festival, which we're still doing it. And that's the place where uh, we really get rid of a lot of magazines and and uh, so forth. I seem to go like crazy. And then we had booths and activities at the Watershed and Natural Resource Festival. 
on Earth Day. And we would have had it today, too, I expect, uh, the, the last few years, but it hadn't been for the COVID virus. But first of all, it was at the Mount Shasta Mall. Then we lo it was relocated to the Caldwell Park. And any um, remembers there? And then we, uh, then it was the Ready City Hall grounds where we ended up finally. And Dan Greeny <clears throat> was uh, early on, maybe not at first, but he was <clears throat> volunteered to make quail calls out of the uh, clothespins, wooden clothespins, which turned out to be the uh, Well, it turned out to be the most interesting thing that that we had, and it really draw the it drew the kids in, so it was very very effective. Hey, I got to correct you there, Bill. That was that was George's import to the chapter, uh, and I I did a lot with it, but that was his that was his fault. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, let me so make that a <laughs> Well, anyway, Larry Jordan isn't here today, I guess. <clears throat> but Larry is, uh, is subsequently, well, right from then, is a workhorse for the chapter and has done a tremendous amount of, of hard work. And one of the things that he did uh, early on was uh, make blanks for uh, birdhouses. And he got the wood that was donated by Chuck Smith, who's passed on now, but his wife still comes with dawn, it comes you know, field trips. He had a lot of wood. And so uh, they cut it up into blanks with even the uh, screw holes in there. And he had it all set up there at the uh, Watershed Festival and then invited children and adults to come and assemble them. And he assembled a lot of them over the years. And then he got people to put them up wherever he wanted them to go. And that worked out okay. The big problem was that, and uh, is that you gotta clean the nest boxes out of periodically, because birds will eventually not nest and when there's, uh, I don't know, half a dozen other nests in there already, or how many it takes. But anyway, uh, that, that was a little, it's just still difficult for him to get work get those uh, cleaned on a regular basis but uh the uh well we're still doing that and uh hey bill yeah yeah i'm here uh so yeah we oh there's we have, there's, uh... there's larry yeah speak up for yourself larry i i, I probably misinterpreted <laughs> what you said yeah, no, that's no. You you said it's perfectly. Uh, we've had um, several helpers with the nest box program, and we still have um, four locations in town where we monitor the nest boxes once a week and uh, clean them out after each um, nesting attempt. Mm hmm. Okay. Well, you're going to be in the Larry. You're going to be in this, the next few items here. Well, maybe not this one, but the next one. We had a, there was a community expo held at Mount Shasta Mall in 2008, and Wintu Audubon won first place for booth decorations. I think this was Phil Aldridge's work, yeah, was it not? Phil it's Aldridge. Phil Amender, yeah. And at the Mount Shasta, oh, well, the one I remember was the Mount Shasta District Fair in 2006. Went to Audubon won second place for its booth and second place for its decorations. Phil on, uh, Aldridge got a demonstration garden. Remember that one? It was right outside the the display building? Mm, no, I don't. I, I, I didn't Surely, hear that. Uh, 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 fairly, uh, uh, um, well, it took a lot of work. 
but he, anyway, it was a demonstration garden. The, uh, that was in 2006, I think. Doesn't seem like that long ago. It seems like everybody should remember that. But then, uh, so that's already been, uh, almost 15 years ago. Now, one of the other things is uh, we collaborated with other organizations. Now, Larry, you can join in on this one, wherever you are. Uh, it was burrowing owls. And it was a species, uh, species of special concern. And Larry um, got going on with uh, members of the Aldecow Audubon. And they constructed uh, three artificial burrowing owl habitats. Right, Larry? Uh, yes. Well, we, we have uh, the main one in Chico at the Tuscan Preserve. Yeah. Uh, and it, yeah, it's well, the only location. It's the only you, lo it was built in 2010, and you had eight nesting chambers expanded to 24 in 2017. Correct. That's impressive. Anyway, they produced they several produced, offspring. Yes, they produced several offspring. Um, I actually need to head down there soon. So I can see um, if there's any birds uh, there this spring. Yeah, so it's, it's been quite a bit of work done there. And another one was a cooperation with the Tehama Wild Care and in cost of installing an osprey nesting platform at the Anderson River Park. And we just did this. this last year this time and they were nested successfully the first year did they not larry i think so uh correct yeah then we also cooperated a little bit with a snow goose festival that happens every year it's sponsored by the chamber of commerce i guess in chico with help from aldecal and I led it uh, one year at Lima Ranch, or maybe two, and then with Frank, with John Kuhn. And we had enough people that we went around Lima Ranch counter uh, clockwise, and then one and one person, John, maybe say, took the clockwise circle, and I took the counterclockwise circle, and then halfway around, we compared notes, and then we continued on our way. It was maybe kind of a fun thing. And then uh, Frank Sanderson, who's now um, over in Ukiah or someplace, he he led it for a few years, and I don't think it's, I don't know whether um, the, whether the uh, COVID uh, restrictions eliminated our participation or whether or what, but I don't know. It's been a couple of years since we've done it. And then we had an information table at the um, local chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And there were uh, natives and landscape, and I think Linda Aldridge organized that. And we had a little, just a little table there with information. One of the other, I'm almost done here. One of the other uh, things was a. Uh, uh, what to do about Oregon Gulch. Oregon Gulch is a piece of wildland in southwest Reading. And um, they were going to sell it. Um, originally, it was purchased or it was going to be used for the dump. Like well, over there at Benton Field, where they had the dump there and they closed that off. They were going to dump this. I don't know why uh, this seemed like a crazy idea because they're there are seasonal streams that come down through there. Um, and I'm, I'm sure in Kenyon, I think it's Kenyon Street, down on South Market. So that didn't seem like a good idea. Anyway, they didn't, they went over to Igo. So this is a piece of wild land. And we held a few, uh, well, George, you early, early on, you led a field trip down through there. Yeah, so, we found Lawrence's gold fence, as I recall. <laughs> 
We saw we saw a Lawrence's Goldfinches. Yeah, there was Lawrence's Goldfinches. Yeah. See, I uh, when I think of a trip, I always think of the the bird that was of interest to me when I was there, and um, not the trip itself, just the bird. But I think Lawrence's Goldfinch was the right word. Anyway, so is the, uh, the nature can, uh, well, here's, where's uh, uh, David, uh, well, anyway, he may not be here enough. David, uh, he, he uh, No, I'm, I'm here, Bill. Oh, you're behind a sign here, I have. Yeah. You know. Oh, there you are, David Ledger, yeah. Uh, he belong, he's the chair of uh, the uh, uh, SEA, which is the, um, David, you can tell me about that. Oh, okay. Uh, that's the Environmental Alliance. Now, it's a collection of, uh, of conservation organizations, and they took that on as a project, and we supported them at the city council, not to sell it, but to, de but to declare it a wild area for the pleasure and in, uh, in instruction of the local habitat and local people, which they have done so. So that was a nice thing that we felt happy about. And then we've had several trips there in the spring. And uh, I remember it because there was a whole big flock of uh, band-tailed pigeons one year when we went through there. <clears throat> Again, the identification of the birds that I saw, not the, not who went or the name of anything else, just the birds. And, uh, that was strange about that. Anyway, we uh, for some years we had a, tr a little trip up Dye Creek in uh, Tehama County with a, a preserve uh, run by the Nature Conservancy. It was an old cattle and pig ranch or something, and uh, it goes up a little canyon there, Dye Creek, very pretty and. <clears throat> But the um, Nature Conservancy, the lower end of the Dye Creek, which goes out onto the flat uh, towards Los Molinos, was planted uh, by with native plants, and so we uh, took it upon ourselves to to survey that to see if the local uh, of the bird communities would change as the plants that were planted there grew up, and we were plan when was through four times a year, but we didn't quite make it always to four times. And looking back on it, the uh, survey was somewhat muddled because we took in some larger trees on the periphery. And so uh, we, the idea was we were going to go up with a planted stuff. And that was only we, the only thing we'd sample. But uh, we it got away from us. So Again, um, early on, Red Bodine, who was uh, very active in field trips and other things, now passed on. He saw a Canada war warbler there, and uh, we believe it was a good birder, but I suspect how oh, I'm always uh, skeptical of these things. So anyway, but then we put it down. It's a nice Nice little bit. The Canada War but was way out of line, out of uh, territory. Uh, but we had another survey that was a cleaner, and uh, because it was taking, um, surveying the, the, the bird populations as the vegetation grew up around the wastewater treatment plant at Lake California. And Lake California decided that uh, they had to, the state was mandating they have to create their, their, their sewer plant. They could have done it the old fashioned way with throwing a whole bunch of chemicals in there and then dumping it into the Sacramento River. But they decided that they would do it more naturally, sort of like the Arcata people did with the Arcata Marsh. Pumping it into a, a marsh with all the vegetation and letting it uh, water fil filter down through and uh, and be good. And you wouldn't have to put it directly into the Sacramento River. So they were starting with bare ponds with just no vegetation. And so I did it for um, four years pretty regularly, but I uh, ran into some health problems. 
and I haven't been doing it again, but we needed, but it would be, and I think it was leveling off. In other words, we had enough vegetation that there wasn't a great amount of change. And the changes and the and things we new things we got were fly ins and you know, just birders that were birds that were there just temporarily, probably, but we need to do it again. And I think I'm up to it now. So maybe this thing will we'll do another one. But the uh, manager of the, uh, well, they call it the Rio Alto uh, plant. She was very interested in having this because it was something they could add into their annual report and show that this, you know, the environmental um, advantages of this, um, this, this plant, this way of treating this, uh, the, uh, the effluent. So uh, she, she always had, you know, wanted to know exactly what was going on in, um, in this, for the spring report. <clears throat> But that's ultimately that finally ends. Anybody have any uh, any more things to uh, add? Well, I just a couple little tidbits I'd like to put in. Oh, by the way, that real alto plant is a, a real benefit to the Lake California. It's got hiking trails and it's oh yeah. It, yeah, it's a wonderful place. I was surprised how it turned out <laughs> because it was so bleak to start with. <laughs> yeah. But um one of the things I remember, one of the first things I remember, one of our meetings, a representative from National Audubon came up and he was trying to get money. They were developing the Sinkion Wilderness State Park over in, in uh, Mendocino County, I guess, and in the Keene Range over there and on down to the coast. And there was a piece of property came up for sale and it was going to be sold very quickly, quicker than the state could act. So he was going around asking people to donate money or maybe it was a loan. I'm not sure how that worked out. But he came to our little chapter. We were having a regular meeting and he gave the pitch. <laughs> and we were so impressed by that we gave our whole bank account. <laughs> we signed it over to him when he left. <laughs> so... Uh, that, that, that he went around telling other chapters that well, this little chapter in here, they just gave their whole bank account to us. <laughs> and uh, twenty five hundred dollars, maybe. About well, that. I doubt it was even that much. Yeah. Think, but still, it was all. You know. <laughs> George, what year was that? Roughly? That was in the. It must have been the late seventies, maybe around nineteen eighty. Well, I think the late seventies. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Oh, when you're talking about uh, the meeting at the Magnolia School at the, uh, state, at the the county superintendent's office, the school district on Magnolia Street, reminded me of a quite a controversy we had that almost uh, well we lost some members from it. There's there at the time there was a camp at, near Manton in the Blue Oak Woodlands, Camp Latiez. And it was willed to, by uh, the widow, I guess, uh, 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 to the county schools. And if they didn't want it, we were the second in line, went to Audubon. I don't remember ever signing anything. I mean, that was just, that's every year or every couple of years, a lawyer would send us a letter at, and the freshening it up, and then oh, gee, there's yep, all these. Well, one member was extremely um, adamant about it. Thought we ought to when it. Oh, when the school district finally decided that they they didn't want to use it, so he gets over there in Manton. Okay, it's a ways to get there from um, from Reading, and it was used as a summer summer camp for students. And my son went there to uh, study a guitar, but there are other people. They had summer home, summer events there, summer camp. It was, uh, you know, dusty and uh, as far as bird life was concerned, it, it was oak titmouse heaven, but that's about it. And uh, we didn't really want it. And besides, if we took custody of it, 
given was free, how do we pay taxes? How do we how do we maintain it? Well, we, maybe we wouldn't have to pay taxes, but we'd have to maintain it. And it was just too much for us. But one of the persons was very, very adamant that we'd missed a bet there. We could have had everything. But Manton is not an easy place to get to. So uh, anyway, there was went on for a couple of years, actually, uh, this uh, hard feelings about the loss of Camp Batiez. Anyway, to wrap it up, <clears throat> Lou, wherever you are, Lou Carrierfell, um, we were, you set us off on a pretty uh, active chapter and we uh, have, feel very um, grateful that you started it. And I know that we, we were, we, lived up to your expectations probably a lot, fur lot further than you really expected. And, uh, but anyway, that's, that's what I have on the uh, history of Winter Audubon. If anybody wants to chip in, do so. Hey, uh, Bill, what, what's happening with this Camp Latiez now? What happened to it? Oh, yes. Well, you see, this is an interesting thing. <clears throat> The whole thing, if we had taken it, we would be on, uh, we would be on easy street now, I think, because one of the big fires went through it, uh, maybe five years ago, one of the myriad fires burned the whole darn thing up, Plant, uh, buildings and everything just went through there. And the school district, I guess it's a school district, school of, got more out of their insurance than they would have ever gotten from the sale of the thing that hadn't been burned up. So um, that was sort of an ironic end to the Camp Latiez <laughs> deal. Is that how you remember it? Yeah, I think that's what happened, finally happened, yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a hot fire, so it, it, it yeah. took everything, you know. Yeah. Bill, I thought you were going to tell us about the Eagles uh, down there at uh, Turtle Bay and the highway improvements. Oh, yes. I don't, you don't have to talk. I'm just trying to embarrass you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll give you I'll get a, a couple of minutes on that. Years ago, but I don't know what the years were, it was 10, 15, say 15 or 20 years ago, The uh, Department of Motor Vehicles wanted to widen the Highway 44 bridge across the uh, Sacramento River and put a, a walkway on there. I guess basically mostly it was a walkway that really did it. And to do that, they had to uh, drive pilings into the river, at least on the bank. And then, you know, how you, when you drive pilings, it makes a quite a noise and, there's, and, it's, and it shakes an area quite large. And there was a bald eagle that had been adopted by um, several people and, uh, and it made to put writing on the map right there in town at uh, Turtle Bay uh, and had been successfully nesting there for some years. Fair. So we got together with the uh, fishing game and the Honolulu and the Department of, of uh, Transportation and other various and sundry people, and uh, maybe John Livingston. You were there. No, he gone. Maybe. Go. Anyway, uh, Sierra yeah. Club was there, and I was there, and so was um, Bruce. Wherever he is, I, don't, I got, I got something. Oh, there he is, Bruce. You were there. Hmm. And uh, we decided that uh, we got to move those birds and we can't nest there because if we started piling after they had nested and, and there were eggs or, or young ones and they had to abandon the nest because they were piling, that would constitute a take uh, on the, um, and, and we would be liable for that. So what are we gonna do? So they put a cone over the existing nest to try to keep the birds from using it 
this is before they actually nested or we put the cone in in the fall and then they so when they came back to nest they would see that and so uh, they um, but they came back and just stared at the cone you know and they were and it was it discombobulated them totally and they oh oh and then in the meantime we had made an artificial nest is that right bruce somewhere yeah and hoping that they would go into their uh, this artificial nest well they they didn't and uh, so finally they took the cone down if i'm not if you're correct and that and the and the pile drivers uh, did their work and the birds uh, tolerated it i didn't of course they weren't happy but they did it and so it made us look like a fool and, and then bad publicity because here we were tormenting these poor, poor eagles by this cone and so forth. <laughs> but it was all uh, in good intentions and maybe naivete on our part, as it turned out. Yeah. Bruce, you're uh, muted, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it was primarily my supervisor, Craig Marks, that was on the site um, throughout, but he shared it with me. Um, I was out there with him at least once, if I'm not mistaken, perhaps twice. Um, it was quite a deal. And he he had quite a job in juggling the, uh, the uh, public awareness aspects yeah. of the whole situation, because as you indicate, I mean, uh, they had to take the cone down primarily because of public, mm -hmm. you might call it outrage. Um, and uh, so it was a real, um, uh, <clears throat> public, um, uh, juggling the public's um, interest, quite a, quite a deal. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, well, it shows that uh, you can't always uh, trust birds to do what you want them to do or expect them to do. Well, it, and it all turned out for the for the good, too. I mean, yeah. uh, they did us a favor, actually. Yeah. And then then, then the birds became really uh, adopted by the uh, some members of the citizenry. Right. I understand. I I understand there's no camera there right now or functioning. I don't know. Yeah, I believe I read that they're hoping to get the camera back in. There is a camera there now. Um, it's a more high tech camera where they can focus the lens and it has night vision and sound and everything. And uh, Liberty just laid her first egg of the season today. Oh. So. Yeah. Right. And check it out. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> you can even watch them at night. <laughs> yeah. Perfect timing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I had a personal response to the two of you. I think that the first organized bird walk I ever went on was Turtle Bay at with wind too, and it must have been in the early 2000s. And I walked with George for certain, and I think with Bill, and part of what blew me away was your, abil your ability to identify those birds by sound. It wasn't just the broad identification, but something would shriek out there and you'd say, oh, that's a turquoise winged <laughs> widget. Listen to that. <laughs> and I, it was miraculous. I, I was hooked and it was uh, the two of you that did it. I couldn't do it now. Thank you. <laughs> I couldn't do it now, no. Actually, the last bird trip I led I was walking along, um, I was up at uh, around Lily Pond at the at, uh, at, uh, Manzanita Lake. And I walked along and uh, I looked back and where's my, wh I'm leaving nothing, nothing. There's no one behind me. <laughs> and I walked, so I had to go walk back. And here they were all focused on a tree. 
with branches that were just, just over my head, not very far. And it was full of birds or birds of interest. I didn't hear them. I didn't see them. And um, so, well, my hearing had, had been going quite a few years. I couldn't hear a, a Pacific Wren say, I haven't heard that for decades. But then a lot of, I don't think there's anybody here that has, a, has young enough ears to hear them either. Maybe so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so that was an exaggeration. So there were, but there were a lot of common birds with lower um, frequencies, but I said in here. And uh, so that's, that's the way it goes. But <laughs> thanks for uh, thinking of me there. Anyway, Catherine is. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Catherine, uh, Catherine, thanks for mentioning that Bill was identifying turquoise winged widgets because he's the guy that to my bird identification said trust but verify yes that's right just like uh who was that uh, ronald reagan like yeah. Go into the bird world. I, yes yeah trust but verify. hey also catherine i just want to remind you um when when the conversations ended i i do want to talk to folks uh, for a moment um Perfect. Yeah. Rebecca? Um, hmm. uh, so when we get to the end, Dan wants to talk to people. OK. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I've completed my talk. So I think George, unless George okay. has something extra. No, I don't think I have anything else. I have a couple of little things, but it's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, what was George going to tell was... us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what little gem are you holding behind, George? Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a minor thing, but maybe it's a good thing to end on. Is uh, every year when it was time to choose officers and board members, it was almost an impossible task. It seemed like for many years, and. Uh, Bill, Bill Oliver and Red Modine would get together over lunch and discuss, because they couldn't get anybody to do anything, how to disband the, <laughs> the club. <laughs> but somehow, you know, later on, people would come out of the woodwork and would have another group leading the way for another year. <laughs> yeah, we did that, George. Yeah. Red Modine and I, he had a place over on the uh, Bichelli Lane and he liked for lunch and we would go over there. Yeah. And decided, well, we earned the money back to the national. And then we'd have postcards for uh, field trips. Every once in a while, somebody would order, so we had to go to such and such a place. So we'd send out postcards to our mailing list, which became quite obsolete after, would have become obsolete in no time, but. We never did that because all of a sudden, um, yeah, people came out of the woodwork and bailed us out. <laughs> well, you notice uh, uh, Michael Carrion and his lovely wife are here. Maybe we can get them back from Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to see all of you, but no, you're not getting us back from Hawaii. <laughs> There they are in the dark there. <laughs> Not that great, huh? yeah. there, we there we go. Yeah. Oh, I see Michael now. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's the Michael I remember. Yes, that's right. <laughs> it, it is it is good to see uh, a lot of folks here tonight. And uh Bill and George and and I, I wish B here to, uh, too, but um a couple years ago. I wanted to do, I wanted to, to kind of say a thank you to you folks for what you've done. And then COVID hit and on and on and, and, uh, and I haven't done it. So I'm going to take this opportunity now. Um, and uh, in, in recognizing you, um, I suppose in some ways, anything that I say about any one of you in large ways could be, could be said of all of you, but I'll try to focus on things that, uh, that were special to you uh, as, as I experienced it. And so, um, you know, Bill, uh, some things that, that really struck me about you throughout these 
many years now, uh, uh, just your, your knowledge of birds and ecology. Uh, and beyond that, your knowledge also of things cultural, uh, of arts, politics, and your ability to converse intelligently in a wide array of things. Um, also, uh, your dedication to uh, a scientific approach to, to integrity, responsibility to facts, um, something that uh, our society could use a lot more of today. And, uh, and so with that, I'm going to share my screen here. Let me get this up. And uh, let's see, we'll... Well, thanks, Dan. And while you're getting that, I'm well, going to another glass of wine, thanks. Uh, okay, well, on, don't go too far away, Bill. Um, you can, okay. Uh, so uh, what we've got here is uh, a, a small certificate and I'm gonna go ahead and pop over to it. Uh, and let me get uh, get this on the full screen here. There. Uh, so this is a certificate of appreciation for Bill. Uh, and it's for your, for your guiding mastery of all things avian, your dedication to informed intelligence, your open-minded curiosity and breadth of interest, and for your essential contributions to the survival and vitality of the chapter. Thank you, Bill, from yeah, the society. Please. And, and uh, you know, Larry, I heard Larry laugh there and he's because he recognizes that photo. All, all the photos I used are from Larry. And I, I used the, uh, the yellow, there, the yellow rump warbler uh, for your, your certificate here, Bill, because it's a, such a versatile bird. And uh, and you're such a versatile person. You know, it's a bird that it can it can fly catch, it can leaf and twig glean, it can feed on the ground, uh, it can flock, it can uh, go go on its own, uh, it can it can migrate or it can stick around through the winter. It's such a versatile thing, and uh, and so I I I want to thank you, Bill, for for the what you've given to the chapter, what you've given to me, and and to our community. And, uh, you know, particularly that last line there, uh, your essential contributions to the survival and the vitality of the chapter. Um, you know, you think about all the things you talked about uh, that the chapter has done that wouldn't have happened if it had died along the way. And you talk about, you know, people's coming out of the woodwork and stepping up and, and going, you, you, you came out of the woodwork for a lot of years for uh, very substantially. And, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's it's the all of the outreach that's been done in in classrooms or the field trips from from the coast to, to Modoc. And you talked about well beyond that, uh, you know, the bird monitoring, you talked about, you know, the snafus along the way, Dye Creek and, and Lake California. But but the solid work there, too. Um, and and. You know things that are are ongoing. Uh, you know Larry's work with burrowing owls and and the osprey nest at Anderson River Park. Uh, you know the the advocacy work that that Bruce is leading right now. That that uh, uh, along with David, I don't uh, and and John. Um, uh, that might preserve uh, Turtle Bay in good shape for for the city. So uh, it's a huge thing and. Uh, just want to say thank you, Bill. Well, um, I hardly recognize yeah. the person you're talking about. <laughs> well, I, I do. I do. And uh, so thank you. And and um, George, uh, uh, just to me, I, George was the president when I became active in the chapter. And um, my kids had had grown up a little older at that point, and and my wife saw in the chirp and chatter the the blurb saying, "Oh, they needed an education chair." And I was a teacher, and my wife said, "You know, hey Dan, they need an education. You better go do that." And uh, so I contacted the chapter, and 
And uh, well, after a little bit, George gets back to me. You know, I figured, okay, I'll do this education chair thing. And uh, George got back to me, said, you know, we would like to start you off as a uh, director at large. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, that was the perfect thing. And it was something that I came to really appreciate in George, um, just uh, he, the way he'd work with people and bring people along. And uh, he, he always did that with, with a sense of respect for who the person is and for making them successful. And, um, and so I, I really appreciate that. So uh, George, uh, you know, a thank you for your considerate, good-natured management your down-to-earth discernment, and your reliable collegiality, for in short, your citizenship. And to me, uh, I've just really appreciated how you think about what we are as, as people and as a community and, um, and how you work to make that work. Uh, and I, I chose the acorn woodpecker there uh, for your photo because they work together as a community, and uh, and it does take some some, if you will, planning ahead, uh, looking at how things are going to work and making them work. Uh, so uh, George, I, I want to say thank you uh, to you there. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and by the way, these certificates aren't just on my screen; they, they're they're printed out, and I'll uh, I'll be sending those off in the mail to you. Now, B isn't here tonight, but I don't think that means that that uh, I should skip her. So uh, we'll go ahead and give her some recognition. Thing about about B, uh, to me, you know, she she always really, really sensible, just a good, sensible person, and uh, and beyond that, um, uh, she really. Um, practiced and urged the chapter to practice respect. Um, and, uh, you know, I talk about, about the chapter surviving and being able to do a lot of good for that. She, she I think, really um, contributed to the quality of what the chapter is. Um, and uh, I remember one, one conversation I was having, where, and I'm not sure if it was she or I who came up with the word in, in the conversation. We were talking about northern pintails. And just, um, uh, well, the words she came up with, they're so elegant. And, uh, and so I, I used that word because, because I think it's, it's a word that applies to B, too. And so for B, uh, for your elegant service to the Wintu Audubon Society, consistently calling the chapter to the highest standards of professionalism, grace, and human decency. And I know she's not here, but thank you, B, and, and we'll get this off to you. And for her, I chose the, the quail because, uh, because they, uh, they work together. Um, they live in, in the community and, uh, and, and help one another out. And, uh, and so I, I, chose that to, to put on these here. Um, so I'll be getting that off to, to uh, all three of you. And uh, Bill and George, thanks so very much for, for what you are. Um, Thank you. And uh, that's, that's all that I have on that. I, I am going to, while I'm, while I'm yakking, um, I know that you brought up, the, and you reminded me of it there, a few times, just the, the need for new officers. And I don't know if uh, Rebecca wants to address it or anything at this point, but if anybody's out on this call and, and would like to get involved in the chapter, um, you know, I, I know we have, we will have some openings uh, our, our, uh, for our new board. It's a couple of months away yet, but uh, I know we'll have some openings. And if you talk to George, he'll tell you, yeah, I start out as a director at large, you know, where you have no responsibilities, but get to participate. And as he put it to me back then, learn the ropes. Um, so, uh, all right, thanks very much. I'll get out of sharing this screen here if I can figure out how. Um, <laughs> Thank you, everyone, and thanks, Bill and George and B, even though she's not present. And thanks, Catherine, for this wonderful idea that you had to have this presentation. Absolutely. And th th many thanks to Dan, too, for adding. Well, thank you at the end. That was great. 
Yes. Nice. Very well deserved recognition yep. for all of them. All right, everyone. Well, thank you for being with us tonight, and uh, we'll see you at the next one. Uh, Catherine, you want to talk about the the next presentation? Uh, actually, maybe I'll ask for some help from Larry. Um, we, our presentation in March will be on the birds of McGee Marsh. Mm. Uh, that's uh, correct. Ju is it Judy Adams? Yeah, yes. Bill and Judy Adams. Bill and Judy Adams. Yeah. And Judy was on the call. Judy, you're still there, aren't you? What, was she? She was she on the was. call. She um, hmm. hmm. I don't see your name I, I, now. No, I did. Yeah, well, she she's a phone number. Um, but uh, uh, anyway, um, I, Larry, I guess it's yours. Well, that's the presentation March. in March. We're looking forward to it. And thanks, Larry, yeah, they, for helping to set it up. Yeah, I'm sure Judy has lots of uh, incredible photos of warblers and um, all the other all the other birds that you find at Maggie Marsh. Great. Then we'll see you all for the Maggie Marsh presentation with Judy Adams. And um, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Good Thank night. you, Bill. Thank you all. All right. Thank you, Dan. All right. Bye-bye.